I'm Erin Walling. I'm the Social Accountability Strategist for the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. Joining me in our presentation today is Dr. Ian Wetter from the University of Manitoba, but he is the man with many titles. I know he's their Social Accountability Lead there, so I'll uh, maybe leave the introductions um, to himself there to, to cover in a minute. Uh, Ian and I are both currently actively working on strategic planning, so really Today is a, it's such a great opportunity for us to be able to share our experience so far, our challenges, our questions, hear about um, you know, your similar experiences, uh, what you might be able to suggest for us. And really this information, I guess, is kind of hot off the presses because we are just in the middle of, of doing this work ourselves. So I can't hear any of you just so that you're aware of that. So Lisa does have everybody muted and she will unmute at discussion time just to kind of reduce that background noise and i can't see the chat box or anything as uh, either i assume ian probably can remotely there yeah, uh, yeah. okay he's nodding his head uh, but i can't hear in the room just just so you're aware of that so our objectives for today really are to go through the the challenges and questions faced in strategic planning i guess that, that ian and i have specifically been facing to discuss the consultative process so far and the environmental scans that we're both involved in, and then the potential supports and the drivers for planning and, and what needs to be done now in order to set us up uh, for, the, for good operational plans and, and, and metrics and drivers in the future. So with that, uh, Ian, I think I'll turn it over to you. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay, perfect, great. Um, so I, I, yeah, I don't need to run through the few titles that I have, but I'm, I am the social accountability lead here at the University of Manitoba. I'm also a family doctor and uh, I am uh, by no means a social accountability expert. And so part of the reason why I'm kind of happy to be uh, participating in this webinar is because I feel like some of the traps that we have fallen into or some of the tensions that we've encountered are kind of endemic to the work. Um, and those of you who are on this call know that, um, but I think it uh, will be helpful for us to kind of look at the ways in which we might get stuck in some of those things. So, um, so I think this, I mean, I don't put this slide up to do, to give a sort of exploration of wicked complex problems, but I do want to just explore the fact that, um, that I think when we were talking about social accountability, we are dealing with a wicked complex problem. And whenever we have problems like that, um, uh, it, it's sometimes not very satisfying to go from consultation to strategic plan to action to outcomes uh, because the problems are evolving as we try to solve them. Um, and as a result, um, if we're wired expecting that um, if we can articulate the problem well enough and articulate the solutions well enough, then we should come to solutions. And I think that that does often doesn't happen that way in social accountability. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that uh, that there's a reason for that, and it's because the problems that we're trying to solve are evolving as we're trying to solve them. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that uh, it sometimes can lead to some feelings of uh, perhaps a sense of futility or a sense of uh, being unsure about ourselves. Um, and I think those of us that have done this work have kind of flowed through those those feelings from time to time. And uh, and I think that it's worthwhile just knowing that. Uh, that it, these are sticky problems to solve. So if you're feeling stuck, um, although I can see that most of you around the around this table are experts in this, but if you're feeling stuck, that that's endemic to the territory. So we thought we'd include this slide that comes from uh, the the work that Bob Woolard and Eric Lachance and myself and Lisa Yo and Kira Kopke and we had a, a previous research analyst as well. We've been working on this for about the last two years, looking at this, this study of, of what's driving social accountability and, and successful work across the country. And one of the, the key strategies that has, has emerged is having an actionable vision and mandate and how important that is. But this quote in particular, I think, really resonated with us because it's, it's, for me personally, something that we have been thinking about here in that how do we start to move past the World Health Organization definition 
that it's, it was a great start to the work that we do, but it's very broad and it's very hard to operationalize when you're actually trying to, to implement social accountability work. <clears throat> so this study, I think, has been really important to, to evolving, I guess, this work as we go along. And, and hopefully there'll be a paper out soon that we'll be able to, to share with everybody. So here at the University of Saskatchewan in our College of Medicine, we do have a social accountability strate strategic plan right now from 2016 to 2020. So we are in the process of doing strategic planning again because that plan's about to expire and our operational plan for our division of social accountability is about to expire. So as we move forward with looking at that in about the last six months, these are the, some of the really important questions that our group here and myself started to, to really think about. So if we are creating a strategic plan, is it for the entire college? Is it just for our division? So do we set priorities then for other areas, UGME, PGME, you know, research, or are we being cognizant of their areas of where they've already set priorities and making sure that our plan supports the work that they do? We're on the verge of having an Indigenous health division here. So again, how do we align with them when that division isn't actually created yet and make sure that we're being supportive? Uh, not overlapping work, but uh, supportive of each other's work. How do we determine priority health needs? So that's kind of become a bit of a buzzword. And what does that really mean? And whose priority health needs? Who should we be consulting? And when we are consulting with people, what are the really good questions that we want to ask? Because there's nothing worse than consulting with people and it being a waste of their time and a waste of your time and that you don't really ask the right questions. And how will those questions really inform the work we do? Another important question is who approves the plan? So for us here, we have social accountability as a priority area. Is it just senior leadership that approves that then? Or is it something that all the leaders across, um, and not just the leaders, but those doing the work across the college need to also approve as well? And once we have something in place, how do we make sure we communicate that and we have a unifying definition of social accountability and everybody's aware of it and sees themselves in it? So social accountability as kind of this umbrella term is, is a fairly new term. It's kind of a new to the game, but certainly this work has been being done for a long time, but in different pockets. So whether it's Indigenous health or global health or community engagement, certainly these committees, these champions, this work has existed. And how do we now embed social accountability in a way that uh, is supportive and inclusive. And of course, there might naturally be some tensions in doing so. So how do we move from a place of, of tension to synergy? And, and how, do we, how do we move forward in a, in a mutual way? Because it's, it's probably pretty obvious that all of us really have the same intentions behind the work that we do. So that's certainly something um, that I think for Ian and I both is really an important thing that we've, we uh, need to keep in mind. Yeah, and I think like when I think about the tensions, um, it, it's interesting the way in which they they come up because some of the ten the tensions come about because um, uh, different uh, groups within a university have different goals, and those goals are in fact in tension with each other. But sometimes it's actually we have ultimately the same goal, um, but people have perceived it as their territory to sort of to solve that problem, and that when we come in with a social accountability lens. We need to do a bit of a dance to try to make sure uh, that people don't feel like um, we're coming at it from a place of treading on their territory or that we're being sort of self-righteous about the work that we're doing um, and really wanting to say, so what is it that we're trying to achieve and how do we, how do we get there? Um, and so one of the things that, um, that does come up is about identifying the priority populations. Um, and so when we think about that, um, when we think about like, what are the kind of unifying features of the the communities that we want to focus our educational attention on. Um, when you look through this diagram that comes from the University of Saskatchewan, but it looks like there's a whole bunch of uh, different constituents and oftentimes universities will look at this and say something along the lines of, you know, well, we couldn't possibly meet everyone's needs. Um, you know, that we're going to end up with a cacophony of voices if we try to ask these groups of people to come around the table. How do we make something of this? Um, and I think some of that comes about in the, the language that we use 
um, uh, at, when we describe priority populations. And I think oftentimes we end up using language like groups who are vulnerable, uh, groups who are marginalized. Um, and I and I heard sort of a critique of that kind of language as it can be disempowering of the communities that uh, whose needs we're we're trying to meet. And really, there's been language that has sort of moved to you know say structurally disadvantaged communities or communities that are under resourced or underserved. And I've even uh, recently heard the use of the language of communities who are under threat, um, so that it doesn't come across as being kind of like a natural condition of these communities that they've ended up not being well served by the system, but in fact that is the outcome of a strategic uh, approach um, that has put communities in these positions. And when we think about that, I think it's actually really helpful for us in social accountability because there are ways in which these um, seemingly disparate communities are being confronted by really consistent um, uh, systems um, and oppressive systems. And then as opposed to focusing on how can we uh, better serve community A, B, C, D, E, F, G, um, we might be able to say, what is it that's consistent in the systems that are leading to these communities being um, um, having uh, poorer outcomes than other communities and how do we as a university think about targeting those systems as opposed to um, having sort of a menu of services for each different and diverse community. And I think we need to do a bit of both of those things but I think that there are, there are really clear consistencies and when we, when we look at some of the guiding documents that Aaron's going to talk about, um, what comes out of those reports and those inquiries and those guiding documents are really consistent messaging about the ways in which the healthcare system reinforces um, oppressive systems, but also that there is a responsibility for us if we're going to really think about aiming upstream and trying to uh, interrupt those oppressive systems uh, at their origin. And so, um, what I'd like to do with this next slide is just, I'd like to hear from those of you, yes, and I see a hand up, so that's just perfect timing because what we wanna do is open this up and Lisa, if you can unmute people. Um, I just wanna hear about, from the perspective of trying to define priority populations and, and uh, hit some priorities and have unifying language around social accountability and bring people to the table and the tensions and the synergies in other, in other universities. I wanna hear from the rest of you around the room. So Bob, I see a hand there. Ian, this is a wonderfully um, focused description of the territory and some of the challenges. What I would contribute, uh, partly because of age, is uh, is a historical perspective. I kind of wryly commented in the uh, in the chat box at the beginning that it's it's delightful to be part of this revolutionary cell because I think we're talking about making some dramatic changes, or really about some for transformative changes uh, in the way in which uh, medical schools, in particular, but broader than that, uh, medical schools in conjunction with communities and with their sister professions might bring about change at a whole host of levels and. I think it's helpful to look at the history of revolutions and the fact that, um, you know, say the, the classic uh, revolution, uh, the Russian Revolution over a century ago, uh, the Bolsheviks took in one, the Mensheviks, the white uh, army, etc. You know, that in fact, uh, we ran very quickly ran into whose territory is this uh, and whose lens do we look at when we try and pick this transformation. And I think your extensive slide that showed all of the folks uh, that, uh, that, that, are, that we need to, in some measure, attend to. And where I think, I guess what I'm saying is, I think the lessons of history were that if we're going to engage those, we need to be <laughs> where we're coming from. Uh, and each of them may have different resistances to being engaged. Each of them may have their own language that they impose on everybody else or seek to impose on everybody else or or indicate that they want to speak uh you know whether adjectives verbs and so on and that's sometimes a frustrating conversation but as you i think are indicating one that we need to undertake at the academic level within the institution we, we, I, I think it's helpful to remember that medical schools have been associated with universities since how do I in, 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 this, in the 15th century? Uh, and in the academic literature, the idea of intersectionality very quickly comes. 
to the fore. Um, so in the last half of the last century, there was a lot, uh, initially out of conflict, conflict between uh, the civil rights movement, which to significant extent in the States was race-based, and the feminist movement, which was gender-based. And the, the movement forward, uh, there was a lot of jealousy and, and a, uh, a lot of lost opportunity because there was friction, you know, if I'm a black woman, what, where do I suffer most, etc. Mm -hmm. How do I uh, emancipate my, myself most? And so that in that literature, and I hope this doesn't sound too vague, but in that literature, this idea of intersectionality that you don't um, get into a, an Olympics of who suffers the most or who's marginalized the most or who's at risk the most, uh, as much as you say, uh, this is uh, an attempt to collectively approach uh, the, you know, the, the EDI, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion, and how do we work together to that? And language around intersectionality may help sometimes, I don't think it'll help too much in the community, although sometimes it does, but in the academy. So I just throw that out as kind of a overarching um, reflection of, of what the territory is and how we could get a lot of frictional heat loss if we try to uh, move into one particular area, as opposed to trying, as I hear you calling us, to try and keep all of this complex array of ideas and perspectives uh, in our mind as we move forward. So hope that's useful. Oh, that's that's very useful. And I think one of the strategies when when um, social accountability leads do scans is to try to help people um, frame what they're doing um, in the in somewhere in the neighborhood of social accountability. So I was just recently speaking to some department heads here at the University of Manitoba and our pediatric lead said something along the lines of, well, I don't really know about social accountability, but we're doing a lunch and learn where we're bringing together the members of the pediatric department to learn indigenous languages. Um, and I and she was sort of wondering whether or not that had anything to do with social accountability. And I said, oh yeah, that is exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about. And so I think one of the things we wanna to try to do if we're doing a scan as part of our strategic planning is to really sort of um, uh, using the language of appreciative inquiry, uh, find, fan, and spread those kinds of little things that are happening and sort of say, oh, hey, well, if the Department of Pediatrics is offering an Indigenous languages lunch and learn, um, couldn't other departments sort of be inspired by this? And would they be able to put it in a bigger room and invite other departments to join in and those kinds of things? But also to, because I think there is a risk that we look like pious, uh, self-righteous people coming to departments and saying, you're not doing a good enough job. And I really want to work against that and say to people, this stuff that you're doing is exactly what we're talking about with social accountability. Let's do more of that. Any other comments from the people around the around the room, the virtual room? Well, hearing nothing, why don't I move us along then? Um, certainly we have another opportunity to ask some questions and, and have some more discussion a little further on. It's nice that um, Bobby brought up and, and Ian issues related to environmental scan, because that's what we're going to move on to next here, is talking about the environmental scan process that, that each of us have gone through. Sorry, let's change that. Remember two things at once here. So what's on the screen there is the environmental scan process that, that I've gone through here over about the last six months. So looking at internal documents and information, looking at things externally, as well as the consultative process. And I'll go through each of those in a little bit more detail in, in a moment. But one of the questions that really I've been trying to ask as I do this is getting at actually what you've just been talking about. Um, how do we define more specifically, or do we find, define more specifically, the subgroup of people that, that we want to work with? Um, do we need to define specific disease topics, or do we need to focus more on social determinants of health or structural determinants of health? These are certainly um, questions that uh, I've had on mind as, as I've been going through this environmental scan. So first of all, I just want to show you uh, some of what I've been looking at. This here is the University of Saskatchewan Plan 
till 2025. And certainly it encompasses some principles of social accountability. It has some very inspiring language around boundless collaboration and engagement, reconciliation, indigenization. So how do we ensure that us as a college, that we fit within this larger university plan? So certainly something for us to, to at least consider. We also, as a college, have a, a high level strategic plan. Social accountability is one of seven strategic priority areas as a college. So we need to consider the relevant language being used in other priority areas. So we have, for example, uh, um, Indigenous health there. We also have distributed medical education looking at you know, rural and remote areas um, of, of medicine and physicians practicing. So we need to be cognizant of that and how we kind of all fit together and using the same language and, and supporting each other's priority areas. Because social accountability is a priority area, we have had specific language around social accountability now being embedded into vision statements and, and priority areas within the different programs across our college. So UGME, PGME, we have continuing medical education there, distributed medical education with very specific wording there. And how do we as a division of social accountability make sure that we are supporting the work that's been identified there uh, certainly there's been questions around do we drive the work or do we support the work and those are important questions for us to figure out moving forward. We also have a current social accountability priority statement so this is part of the strategic plan for our college. So there it does define kind of I guess how we view social accountability as a priority and we do have a, a bit of a I guess a discussion internally about do we alter this at all right now because we have a current college plan that goes until 2022 but language matters and making sure that this meets sort of local people's needs and that everybody in the college can see themselves in it and that is also something that we can operationalize as a college but also for ourselves as a division of social accountability. So those are things that, that we need to, to consider and we've certainly been discussing here. The way that we are likely going to approach it is to leave this as is because of the current plan in place and then in 2022 align our planning again with the college's planning and in the meantime we're going to create a new vision and mission and principles for our division of social accountability that then support our new operational plan. So it's important um, to consider, you know, how our division work affects the college because we do have to report to senior leadership. Every six months, we actually report on the status of our work based on our operational plan. And that is what this is. So this is the report uh, where it's blank there. That's what we fill in as a division every six months. And it's sort of a green, yellow, red, status report that we fill in there and all the different priority areas do that and they're printed off and actually taped up on the wall and all the senior leaders gather around and they talk about each of these areas and if there's any areas in yellow or red then they can have a discussion about how they can maybe be helping each other out in, in overcoming the challenges in those areas. So your strategic plan has to be supportive and work in collaboration with priorities across the college, um, but it also needs to be operational. So it has to be operationalized. And this is a picture actually of my door in my office. Uh, and I actually have my operational plan posted there. It's, it's highlighted uh, for different colors based on when I was reviewing it for those status reports. So on the right taped up there, you can see one of those status reports there. And so every six months, this is a really important thing for me to go through and, and our team to go through to help figure out whether we are on track or not, or if maybe we're starting to get into kind of more of a yellow zone or, or red zone, and that we might need our director then to, to speak to other senior leaders around what maybe can be done to, to help in that area. So that's really important too, to keep that in mind as, as your strategic plan is supposed to ultimately create plans of action and, and be operational.
So another part of this process has been an external scan. I actually spent an entire day searching the websites of all the colleges of medicine across the country and searching for terms like strategic planning or strategic plan, I should say, and social accountability. And certainly there was a mix of really, it, it actually speaks to the diversity in this area, a real mix of what or and how people approach this work in terms of uh, vision statements in terms of principles, in terms of uh, whether you categorize things according to objectives or goals or pillars, and some colleges that don't have anything reported on their website. Certainly, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of behind the scenes work, uh, but nothing on, on their website. So it really is an interesting mixed uh, representation. And I thought it was important to, to try and look to see what others are doing. Uh, it, it, it's a downfall in that I'm sure there's lots of stuff that's not on websites, but it was a, something to at least try to see what others, what others are doing. Also looking at key articles and websites and tools. Aspire is something that, that we went through last year, so certainly that was something we found important to look at in terms of language there, since it is senior or I guess experts in social accountability across the world that are part of that application process. The Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Report are a really instrumental work that's been done these last few years. It's really important for us to figure out how we can further support, and, and sometimes in creative ways. So even if the language isn't um, geared to us as a college, there's certainly a lot that we can pull out of those reports. Uh, Bob Willard and others has done some work around uh, accreditation requirements and making some recommendations there. We want to make sure we stay in the loop of that work that's going to be coming up. There's um, the student groups across um, Canada that have students' toolkits. So I thought it was important to look to that. Certainly current literature is kind of endless. Uh, a few key pieces there, particularly stuff that we've been involved in authoring in the past, I uh, revisited. The Tennis Declaration and then, of course, the NET website are all important pieces that, um, that I want to make sure I consider. Erin, I just want to say something to that last slide, which is um, both like these um, external uh, articles are really key when we're, if you're ever encountering resistance within your institutions. Um, and so just one of the things that came up recently in a meeting that we had with our department heads um, was a reluctance to adopt the language of social accountability because there was real question of who in fact are we accountable to um, and maybe we should use a term uh, more like social responsibility and it was really useful for me to be, to be able to lean on some of the foundational work around social accountability and the reason for the for the evolution from the term social responsibility to social accountability um, and uh, and to be able to sort of uh, put our leadership in a position where I said, okay, you know, we, we could make that change, but we would need to then be accountable for the fact that we are um, going, coming out of step with our international partners and the international consensus around this. And so mm -hmm. um, those documents are really useful uh, from that perspective. And then because universities, at least uh, in my experience, ours, but I know others are really responsive to student feedback when we've got a driver for social accountability like like the IFMSA, um, uh, it just is really uh, powerful to be able to say, you know, like there's a there's an international consensus growing on this, and students want it, so uh, mm -hmm. so we can, yeah. you know, we can use those to drive that when we encounter resistance. Yeah, thanks for that, Ian, because I think that's that's a good point. We our strategic plan, we all need to be able to explain well and justify what's in it and where it, where it came from, which I think consultations are a really big part of as well, and I think. Ian and I have approached this a little bit differently so far in, in our strategic planning. So I'll, I'll go through a little bit in terms of what we've been doing here for consultative sessions. On that slide there on the left-hand side are the different groups that we specifically engaged with and, and gone through a bit of a consultative process with. And on the right is a list of groups that I would like to send. Uh, I call it their first draft, but what we're gonna create is really a, a one pager that's kind of a high level overview of our strategic plan. So it will likely begin with that priority statement I showed earlier, and then a vision and mission statement for our division of social accountability and our principles. And that will be the one pager that then I would send out across, well, really anyone who's been involved in consultation and across our college, as, and that would include um, some of the community that we've connected with to review that. And then I'll go on to create a more detailed strategic plan and operational plan. On the left is who we connected with. So we started off with a couple of strategic planning sessions in Saskatoon and Regina, 
we had some community-based organizations attend, and we had a really great representation and mix of people from across our college attend those sessions. So those were kind of what kick-started for us. Then I connected with our Social Accountability Committee, our Diversity and Inclusion Working Group, and our Indigenous Health Committees to get some very specific feedback. In fact, this slide here is one of the slides that I showed them um, just as part of the, the review process itself to make sure that they agreed with how we were kind of doing this work and, and help us identify maybe some missing pieces. I also reached out to all our department heads and asked for representatives from those departments to come together. So we had a couple meetings there with uh, department representatives and some great discussion there. It was actually a really great way to re-engage and with our departments and, and we do some work with them, but um, it, it, I think it's important to point out that with strategic planning, it is actually a great opportunity to re-engage maybe with groups that you haven't in a while. So that was a great opportunity. I think a lot of what came out of that though will be more something that supports the operational work, but there were certainly lots of ideas that came out of there for the future. I did connect with our medical student society. It's tough to engage with students. And I, I can say that that's one group that hasn't had a lot of input um, on this yet it's hardest to to engage with clerkship students and residents because of their the time commitments of their clinical work but yet that's the group that i would want to engage most with versus say first and second year students that haven't um, yet engaged really with patients we also have a program here called making the links and we brought in um, our community partners from that program from the indigenous communities that, that take those students from that program, mostly from the north, and we have one community from the south, and they were here for meetings, so I was able to join on to that and have a, a session with them and get some feedback um, on the plan as well. In red, I have highlighted in red public consultations, because that was one of the questions that I did ask the committees and, and um, the groups here that I, I met with, whether they felt like we should have public consultations. And we, for us, we decided not to. We've, we've engaged with um, the community-based organizations and, like I said, are making the links partners as more of our public representations. Uh, and, and, and my other question there was asking people whether we felt like we had enough diverse perspectives, because that's certainly very important as well. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, been our consultative process so far. Oh, and I should point out we haven't specifically engaged with government. Uh, in terms of that Pentagram partnership, we do struggle with that a little bit in terms of our, our consultations so far. We haven't reached out to government. We haven't had a lot of health region uh, engagement as well. So that's something I hope to do more so with that one pager once we have something created. So I just thought I'd share this too before I turn it over to Ian to go through his um, process because one of the things that we asked in all of our consultative processes, in all of our sessions, was what is one word that comes to mind when you think of social accountability? And we recorded all of that and we put it into a word cloud generator program online. And any word that was used more than once or, or however long or however it's used, the more it's used, the bigger the word is on the word cloud. So certainly equity really um, jumps out at you there. And, we want to make sure that uh, we were figuring out some way to really include people's language and, and uh, the current words that people identify with. So this is actually something that we plan to look at when we're using our language in our strategic plan as well. So I'll turn it over to you, Ian. Okay, great. Um, so I, I'm going to just quickly go through these, but I wanted to just give an example of what this might look like at a different uh, at a different university. Um, so we've just come through accreditation, um, and now we're in the process. Um, a lot of our priorities were set um, before we had significant community engagement, and so now we're in the process of kind of reaffirming some of our priorities and adjusting some of our priorities uh, in accordance with uh, what we're hearing from from our community partners. And so this is just, so at the University of Manitoba, our uh, health colleges, uh, five of them, so uh, nursing, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, college of rehab sciences, and medicine are amalgamated in a uh, faculty of health sciences. And so at the, the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences level, social accountability is uh, one of our uh, key priorities. And then if we just go flip through to the next slide, that sort of priority, if I, am I able to adapt these slides or do I need to rely on somebody else to do that? Sorry, can you oh. see it? Oh, yeah, I can. I was just oh, wondering no, if I, if that's okay, perfect, no I problem. I don't think so, I can move them for you. Great, 
No problem, thank you. Um, and so then within the College of Medicine, um, within our strategic plan, social accountability is one of the key pillars. And so it's one of four key pillars that exist within our strategic plan. And then the, and those rest on a kind of foundation of Indigenous respect and achievement. And then if we uh, take a look at the next slide, within that Max Rady College of Medicine strategic plan, there's a specific uh, area dedicated to social accountability and under social accountability there are five key priority areas and then those five key priority areas each have programmatic goals associated with a with a specific measure and so um, if we look through to the next slide in terms of the um, operational plan and so from though the the previous slide in which each of those five uh, key priorities under social accountability they're all broken down into their uh, programmatic goals. So if you just look there on the left-hand side of the slide, it says each department to define contributions and actions for community engagement. And then it, similarly to what they've done at the University of Saskatchewan, this is re operational plan is reported to both the department heads and the Dean's Council um, and graded in the sort of uh, uh, green, yellow, uh, red um, grading uh, structure. And that has actually been uh, really useful to drive some of this change and to make sure now um, it, one of the things that is not ideal in my mind is that our measures are not things that are e easily measurable now and so a lot of our outcomes end up being uh, like long paragraphs of outcomes I'm hoping as we go forward um, and maybe with some of the work of this network we'll be able to tighten up um, the outcomes and get to a little bit more of a um, you know just a and more succinct reporting uh, that comes out of that. Um, just moving on to the next slide. Um, when we talk about uh, consultations, one of the things that came out again from our, um, when speaking to leadership at our university was, you know, to what extent are we accountable to community? Are we not accountable to the funders of the university um, and, to the, um, and to the health systems that require workforce? Um, and there was some question about the, uh, to what extent we're accountable to community. And when I explored that further, really what came out of that was a fear that if we do extensive community consultation um, and we promise a shift in health outcomes, for example, um, we don't want to oversell the extent to which the academy is able to achieve uh, changes in health outcomes. But I think at the same time, we, and I, like I agree with that, that we don't want to over promise and under deliver. But at the same time, um, I think that we also uh, don't want to be in the position where we're abrogating our responsibility to address the um, underlying social determinants and to really push back. We, you know, at least in Manitoba, but I'm sure everywhere, the academic institutions are, have got really significant um, influence over policy decisions, and I think that we need to exercise that influence uh, carefully. And so I think when we look at the points around the, the partnership pentagram, like there are really are um, guiding documents from um, the other four uh, points on the, penta on the Pentagon, but I think the community uh, point on the Pentagon is really the place where we haven't had adequate uh, pull, and I really like to describe this as these things being in kind of a generative tension with each other and that we need that tension in order for the system to, to function and to make sure that we've got our priorities straight. And so if we've got one of those anchor points in the, in the Pentagon is we, we've got a lack of voice there and we need to fill that in so that there's actually enough tension pulling in the direction um, of community. And so one of the things, if we, if we go to the next slide, um, one of the things that we thought about is the structure of our social accountability committee. And I know that um, some committees in other universities look, they all probably look different, but because we've got the five health colleges together, our committee is at a Rady faculty of health sciences level. And we did some consultation with some key stakeholders and community. And one of the things that they said is that we, that it would be worth our while to have representative voices around the table, but that we want those voices to be part of larger organizations operating in the province, because otherwise we put the representatives around the table in a really uncomfortable position where they're expected to speak on behalf of all Aboriginal youth in Manitoba or all transgender Manitobans or all queer people of color in Manitoba. And so 
Um, we've got representatives from community organizations uh, in, on our committee. We've also got representation from each of the colleges, both student and faculty representation, um, and then some other key members, including Elder Margaret Lavalle and Knowledge Keeper Leslie Spillett. Um, but what came out of that is our community member said, you know, as the representative of Trans Manitoba on this table, for example, I feel really uncomfortable that we would consider this group of us around this table to be representative of the diversity of opinions out there in community. And so if we, um, so they said, you know, we would really encourage you to go out into community and to do some town halls. And so from that community um, suggestion, we've, we've piloted one town hall so far and we've um, piloted it with a um, the Manitoba Harm Reduction Network which is a group of uh, people who use drugs and their uh, and uh, some care providers but mostly it's a peer network and it was really interesting to sit down with that group of people and get some feedback and the feedback that we got I think was actually really um, valuable in terms of getting a sense of where we need to go with this, with social accountability, because we showed them some of our priorities, we showed them some of our guiding documents, but really the key message that came from community is that there is a profound lack of empathy and kindness and compassion in the system. And that when people who are um, uh, um, at the pointy end of oppressive systems are trying to engage the health system, that they in fact are not feeling particularly cared for. So I think that there's something in that that we're going to be have to going to have to be careful about making sure we don't lose in sort of the minutia of social accountability that really at the heart of it all we're actually struggling to um, deliver care in a way that people receive as feeling caring and as feeling um, kind and as feeling compassionate so I think that's something that we're going to have to think of to make sure we don't uh, miss the forest for the tree. Up. Um, for a few minutes, and just to hear from some others around the around the room uh, about um, what other people have done to identify priority health needs. Um, have people in, um, engaged in consultations that were particularly effective, or did people end up in a minefield? And then, are there other key guiding articles or documents that we should consider? I see that Bob suggested one in the in the notes, and I think Lisa's got it uh, got it captured. But any others? Hey, it's uh, Alex Anawati here calling from uh, Sudbury at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. I'm just kind of curious about the uh, questions that you asked at that uh, town hall, that consultation to get at these things of priority health needs. Um, how do you define yourselves or how do you find your community and the people, the patients, the populations that you serve in the region? And if you, if you inquired with that, Town hall meeting whether or not uh, they could identify the stakeholders that actually needed to be at the table to make the decisions. Well, in, a, in our pilot town hall, we we targeted a, a specific group that because one of the members of the of the committee had sort of said we've got a sort of peer network already established, so it'd be worth coming to to meet with them. Um, but the questions that we asked, we got them to uh, reflect on a positive healthcare encounter. Um, and then we got them to sort of break down what were the what were the components of that encounter that made it work for you um, and your community. And if they couldn't, if they hadn't actually had a positive encounter, or if they could imagine a positive encounter, what might that look like and what might be the core components? And then we got them to reflect on what is it that we would need to teach healthcare professionals in order to give them the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to deliver care in that way. That was how we approached our uh, our uh, consultation session. And Erin, I know that you had, had had some. Yeah, so when we, we had those two in, um, initially in Saskatoon and Regina, we asked, uh, and we had half a day, so it was a little bit different. Uh, and, and we didn't have the general public, we had uh, people representing, I guess, the public from community based organizations. So we asked people to think about uh, four years from now what would they like to be celebrating in the College of Medicine in areas around social accountability. And then people brainstormed a whole bunch of different um, ideas and specific actions. And then we actually clustered those and themed them. And then based on the themes, we broke people into groups uh, and to, to really dive down into those themes around what would success look like uh, 
and what are the challenges and, and actions for the future in each of those areas. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Uh, thank you. That uh, gives me some uh, good insight. I just, um, I guess I struggle with the idea that, uh, you know, how do you ask these questions to different groups of people who come from different ethnocentric point of views and live under different social pressures to get at the actual data and information that you want, which really, if you're talking about being socially accountable as an understanding of uh, who you're serving, you know, what their primary health needs are, who you need to engage with, and then, uh, what I, what I liked a lot about from what you shared was the, um, the, I can see how you're probably getting a lot of indicators of success out of that. So things that you can actually measure in the end that you're showing that um, you're, you're actually being socially accountable. So I thought that was, that was really nice. Thank you for sharing that. I should say too that some of the questions and, the, and what I talked about with each of the groups varied depending on the group. And in fact, when we met with the group in Regina, we had a lot more community-based organizations there. So a lot of our conversation ended up really focusing around that and talking about what would a, a physician that is socially accountable look like? What does that even mean? And having some of the conversation there. So it, it isn't necessarily um, a canned one size fits all. And I've really tried to be reflective and mindful of making the conversation meaningful to the people that are there so that they're getting something out of it too, and, and that we're thinking about what we really need to know specifically from that group. So it's, it's a good use of everybody's time, because it's a lot to ask often of people to, to share their time with you. So I can't see the chat. Lisa, is there, are there any questions that have come across the, the chat box? No, we don't have any in there pertaining to this slide, Erin, but. Erin? Can you can you hear me? Uh, yes, softly. Right, okay. Sorry, it's uh, it's Aaron Cameron. Um, I just have a quick question about: Did you use in your in those consultations or when you were identifying some of those those party health needs and conversations? Did you use any other methods, meaning using some arts based methods or ways to evoke beyond just words about what meaning? Um, is ascribed to social accountability. Um, but sometimes I think, again, speaking to kind of what Alex just mentioned about the Eurocentrism of the ways that we talk also serve as barriers sometimes to the things that we think about when we when we think about social accountability in different people and different populations and just different ways of getting at, at it. Yeah, that's a great question because so I think it's, it's important to engage people sort of visually as well and, and, and try and have an atmosphere if you can for creativity. I think um, the question around sort of diverse groups and, and the respect and that sort of thing, if certainly in, in the circumstances where you have a diverse group coming together, uh, that's maybe a bit of a different question. The, for us, the strategic planning sessions uh, we're kind of a, a mix of people from a bunch of different backgrounds, mostly people from the College of Medicine. So we used <laughs> traditional <laughs> facilitation tools. We did a lot of flip charting. We had all the strate strategic priorities um, up on the wall. We used a, a method called uh, workshop consensus method for the visioning and then um, that clustering. So we actually had people write on cards and put it on the wall and we played around with that. And then we had a different color that we used for, for the titles. We flip charted in small groups. So, you know, the tr tr traditional kind of facilitation stuff, um, but for us, nothing, nothing beyond that. Yeah, likewise for us, it was uh, uh, some yeah, sticky notes and flip charts and small group conversation. But I, I really like the idea of something uh, that appeals to a di just different way of knowing and thinking. Yeah, I think it's a good thought. That's something we really tried to think about with our session because the room itself was kind of boring. You know, we, we had talked about putting colored tablecloths. We ended up actually covering the tables with paper that people could write on and having lots of markers and sticky notes available so people could actually write their own notes and stick them on the walls and we tried to have visual stuff that represented our college and our our college's strategic plan around the walls to make it hopefully feel as creative and uh, not as stuffy as as the environment that it unfortunately kind of was 
Karen, there's a question here from Eric, but I want to just add to that and say we, we've used, actually, this is prior to your time, Erin, with the division, but we've done, um, we did a mural-based kind of art thing at one of our global health conferences for, for folks, and that was a really neat way of having people share their ideas and, and thoughts through a different medium, and it ended up being beautiful. But yes, I mean, we haven't used it as far as I'm aware in our strategic planning, but definitely in some, in some of our uh, engagement kind of opportunities. So yeah, Eric had a question here as well, Erin. Eric, are you able to type in? I don't hear you, Eric. <clears throat> Eric, can you hear us? Okay, well, Eric, if you are... He might be able to type in the chat box. Eric, if you can hear us, type your question in the chat box and I'll reiterate it to Aaron and sure. Ian. We can yeah, We can come back to that then if, if Eric's able to send that to you, Lisa. Uh, I should mention too, the, the two consultative processes we had initially in Saskatoon and Regina, we had away from the university, which I think is also uh, really important for kind of getting out of the mindset of uh, kind of trying to get in a different mindset, I guess. And it's, it's nice if you can get away from the university. Are there any other questions? Uh, sorry, it's uh, Alex here. I'm just uh, really kind of stoked to be able to talk to you guys a little bit about this. Uh, I'm really impressed uh, that you're pushing this. You know, we're going through a similar process at the um, our Academic Health Sciences Centre here. We were able to convince them to put social accountability in their strategic plan, although they don't really understand what it means yet. So we're in the process of building the tools to help them achieve that. And I, and I hear a lot of the challenges you're going through, and I anticipate having uh, some of those too. But I'm very, very kind of curious about um, things that you conceptualized, as such as like conditions that um, demonstrate you did a valid type of engagement with community, or that you know that what you sampled for information to direct priority health concerns was um, was going to be reproducible by somebody else. You know, like these methodology type questions to me get get at me while I'm creating the process to develop tools for an academic health sciences center. Because I think that, well, if I'm going to do it here, I want it to be reproduced elsewhere, right? So, so I come to this conclusion that fundamentally there are some universal, probably reproducible conditions that apply everywhere for social accountability, but the context changes every time. So I'm really curious to see if you have any thoughts or ideas on those kind of conditions that you came through within the constraints of what you were given to work with, obviously. Yeah, uh, for me personally, I think the consultation piece is, has been the, the biggest challenge. And I, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a right or wrong way to do it. And certainly, uh, I think the way we've approached it is a little bit different than how Ian's group has approached it. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily right or wrong. I think what's important is, is feeling like uh, you've had the right mix, I guess, of representatives and, and having that community voice. Uh, I, I think for what I would look for is that you're starting to get some overlap from the different groups that you consult with. So that I think is kind of a bit of a, a gold standard rule that once you start to get uh, that overlap and, and some of those same themes emerging that you're, you're probably starting to, to get to that point where you're consulting um, the right mix of people. But, you know, I don't know. I'm certainly, I, I don't feel like I'm an expert on this. I think what Ian was saying at the beginning about social accountability being kind of this in fact, I would say it's a, it's a series of wicked problems that we're addressing. And, it's, and you know, I, we serve the entire province of Saskatchewan. So that's, that's a big group of people. So it's hard to get to that point where you feel like you've fully consulted. I, I think what I've turned to is, you know, we do have a social accountability committee and then Indigenous Health Committee. We have that diversity and inclusion working group. And getting their thoughts was really important for me on how do we more extensively engage with people and, 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 you know, do we need public consultations and do we have a diverse enough group of opinions, I think was, was an important part of it for me. How about for you, Ian? I cannot hear you, Ian. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> a, a little bit of that snowball approach has been really useful and to sort of ask, like, part of the reason why we we had, um, you know, have the people around our social accountability committee that we do is because we talked to some key informants in community and they suggested this sort of 
split of demographic groups. We started with six kind of community, um, uh, sorry, sort of six community representatives. Our community members came back to us very quickly and said, that's not going to be enough. You know, for some of these groups, you can't ask a single Indigenous youth to come to your table and feel safe to speak. So could you please put two people on that list? Um, from Independent Living Resource Centre, they said, you know, we'd like somebody who is both within the organization and somebody who is um, who is work, you know, served by the organization to be uh, to be represented around the table. And then, as we looked around the table, we sort of said, are there any voices that are missing from the table? And then people said, you know, I don't think we've got enough nor northern representation around this table. And so we are I'm sort of worked to add add voices around the table. And I think what we're what we're looking for is um, with, like as we sort of get to the margins of the margins to look for that uh, uh, the overlap and we we haven't hit it yet but I think we are getting close and but a lot of the themes that are emerging are really consistent and if we go back to that slide we think about the sort of oppressive systems um, that act sort of intersectionally across demographic groups um, that you know as we start to sort of flesh out what those are then the picture becomes a lot clearer so whether or not that could be validated and repeated uh, I'm not sure um, but I think there are some I think there are some of those sort of core elements there um, I see Eric posted his question but he had to leave before he got the answer and his question was will you have a board of the community in the faculty of medicine after the co community consultation and so our social accountability committee um, is advisory to the dean of the Rady faculty of health sciences so it is kind of a quote unquote board it's not a community board in the sense that the it still is really run by the university, um, but there is community representation around the board. I'm not sure Eric was here to hear the answer to that question, um, but for the rest of you, that hopefully will be useful. So, Erin, do we want to move on to the last? Yeah, um, Ian, Ian, sorry, it's and Erin, it's Lisa here. I had a message privately from Heather, um, also just pertaining to this question. She was asking, we have a lot of groups carrying out social accountability conversations in community somewhat independently, for example, the Institute for Public Health, Child Health, Indigenous Health Dialogue, Newcomers Research Network, and our Community Engagement Office. The challenge we're seeing is bringing these initiatives together under a faculty-wide strategy. Are there any comments with regard to this? Mm. Yeah, I don't know if there's a quick answer to, <laughs> to that mm -hmm. question. It's a good question. I mean, I guess my only answer to that would be that that I think it is really important for us that if there have been extensive community consultations done as part of university or even non-university, like regional health authority processes, that we kind of launch from there. So that if we can see some signs or signals coming out of that data, that we then make sure that our consultations kind of like launch from that data so that we're not starting at the ground level again and seeing if part of our scan can be to actually coalesce that community feedback uh, into sort of some central uh, some central nuggets of information and then uh, and then making sure that our follow-up questions expand on that That's all I would all I would say about that but I think that that where your social your division of social accountability sits within the university um, will sort of uh, give you a sense of whether or not you can rein that in and sort of bring that under a unified front. So we created an office of community engagement um, for the purposes of trying to um, coordinate our community engagement efforts. Uh, and certainly if people have more questions, they can follow up with, with Ian and I too afterwards by email. But I will move us on to these last couple slides because we just have a couple minutes left here. So um, Ian and I had, had put this together to try and kind of come up with a bit of a flow chart. And I would have found this very helpful to have, have looked at six months ago. And it, it, it's probably not perfect. Uh, there's, there may be something we, we didn't think of here, but it's kind of, I guess, a summary of, of how we see the process and that you need to start with some sort of key direction or mandate or purpose that really is driven by, by your senior leadership or supported by your senior leadership. And, and then you move into that internal external scan, including the consultations and, and, and however you feel like that needs to be approached to, to meet the needs of, of your group. I think we talked about that doesn't necessarily look exactly the same uh, for everybody. But from that then, from that environmental scan, you're pulling your vision, the mission and values. That's what drives creating your metrics, defining your priority health needs and your objectives or goals or pillars or key strategy, whatever, whatever you kind of use to, to categorize it. And all of that is what then rolls up into your strategic plan. 
And then lastly, I just like to think about this, um, and because this is sort of appealing language these days, I like to think about it in the sort of model for change. Um, and to think that like really what we're trying to do with the consultations is get a clearer sense of what is it that we're trying to accomplish. And then when we're establishing measure, measures, what it, how will we know if that change is an improvement at all? And I think that gets to your questions, Alex, about you know uh, how can we make these things re reproducible? Um, and then and then really when we're when we're um, gathering that idea those ideas and going out to community for further consultation that this needs to be kind of an iterative process that we'll have a strategic plan we'll go back to community and try to really make make sense of what are the changes that we can make and are those changes driven by community and then being in these repeated cycles of identifying problems trying to address them through a change man management approach um, and then coming back to the question of like have we actually got our strategic plan right and do we need to make adjustments to it um, and be continued continually able to do that, come back to it and make tweaks and adjustments. So that's the last uh, point that I've got to make and Aaron, I'll let you close. Yeah, I apologize we don't have any more time for questions. It's, it's one o'clock here. I know it's a variety of times across the, the country. Just want to say thank you all for joining us today. I hope you found this helpful. It was great for Ian and I just to have this opportunity to connect with each other and even talk about our own, our own plans. And uh, it's, it's been very valuable. I personally welcome any questions or any suggestions uh, that you want to send to me. Um, I, I'm sure Ian probably feels the same way. Please connect with us both. You'll find our emails within the, the meeting invite itself. Uh, and just to let people know that um, if you're not part of the AFMC network, that uh, you might want to consider joining as we are kind of all like-minded folks that get together a few times a year and talk about these kind of issues. And there is another webinar being planned in March. Sounds like it's probably going to be on metrics and accreditation. I know Ian and I are certainly interested in being part of, of that webinar as well. If others are too, please let me know. Or if you have other suggestions for webinar topics, uh, you can certainly reach out uh, to me as well. So thanks again for your time. The recording will be on our websites and I'll send that out by, by email to the FMC network once it's ready as well. So thanks everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.